So we have a lovely multivariable calculus exam. This is also known as Math 265 locally. It's the first exam that was administered during fall 2023, which means geometry, ba -ba 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 geometry. Yes, it's a beautiful, beautiful subject. We're going to have a lot of fun. We've got seven problems waiting for us. Ah, the good old days of seven problems. I miss those days a bit. But at any rate, we'll need to begin. But of course, as always, before we begin, we want to make sure we put our name down. Because if we don't put our name down, we won't get the credit. All right, let's begin. Number one, a two-part problem. We're going to see that part A, we see spherical, part B, cylindrical. So we're like, oh, so these are about coordinate systems. So, all right, good. So let's start with part A because, well, A comes first in the alphabet. So why not, right? So we have the spherical equation rho is 4 cosine theta sine phi. And we're told it's a sphere. Okay, I'll buy that. Now, we're asked to give the rectangular slash Cartesian equation for the sphere in the form x minus x zero squared plus y minus y zero squared, z minus z zero squared equals a squared, and identify its center and radius. Now, by the way, once we have it in this form, center and radius are pretty easy. So just as a reminder, so what we have here is that the center, that's the x0, y0, and z0, and the radius is what we call a, right? Because that's the a squared. Normally we put r squared, but they were probably thinking, if we put r, that's too much of a hint. Or perhaps they were thinking, hey, since we're in coordinate systems, let's not try to get polar floating there. I don't know. But anyways, this is what we have. Okay, let's do a quick recap of spherical, because spherical can be one that's a little bit uh, confusing at times. So I'm going to draw our space here. And we have our x, y, and z, or z, as uh, Americans like to say. And now what we're going to do is we're going to mark a point. So we have a point in space. There we go, space. And, uh, well, where do rho, theta, phi show up? All right, so let's talk about our various things. Now, if we were to go straight to the origin, where we're marking our center, this line segment here has length rho. Now, if you look at this line segment versus the positive z-axis, there's an angle between them. That angle we call phi. Finally, if you were to drop this down into the xy plane, then what you would get is you'd say, well, I'm forming a right triangle here, and theta is this angle in the xy plane. It's the same angle that comes into place when we're talking about polar coordinates. Okay, now, a few more things to note. Uh, you see this angle phi? It actually shows up in a second place in this picture, and it shows up over here. So this angle in the corner also has angle phi. You can basically reason it in a couple ways. You can say, well, look, here's a right angle. And so phi plus this angle is a right angle. But also because of the right triangle, these two angles, when I add together, make a right angle. So it must be that these two angles match. You can also reason it by geometry. OK, so why does this help us understand? Well, now what you can use is you can use facts about trigonometry, and, and you can essentially say, I know the hypotenuse, I know this angle, therefore the adjacent side, well that's rho cosine, because cosine is for the adjacent. And what is that? Well that is what we call z. Now the opposite side, that's our rho sine. And what do we call that? Well, that's how far away we are from the origin in the xy plane. That's what we call r. So we say, ah, good. Now we've got our whole picture figured out. So this is spherical. OK, so now that we've done all that refreshing, and you don't have to do all of this, it's just for reference what I'm going to point out. <clears throat> Let's start with our equation. 
So we have rho equals 4 cosine theta sine v. Okay, now we want to change this into x, y, z. How do we get there? Hmm, well, uh, rho, rho is distance to the origin, and so that's not too hard to figure out. Rho is okay, has a square root. Rho squared is even better. On the other side, we don't see any rho at all. It's just angles. Ugh. Now that's not helpful because we really need to have some sort of a, a distance measurement. So we really need to get a row on that other side. And now, idea. We want row squared over row, and we need a row on that side. So let's multiply both sides by row. Doing that, we'll get row, row, and uh, well, that sounds sort of like a Scooby-Doo, row, row, uh, but and anyways, no, 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 row, row, row squared. And uh, we say, okay, hmm, how do we think about this? Well, we see sine phi and cosine phi, we multiply by a row, gives us something useful. And in particular, we could say, oh, this looks like four, and we can have row sine phi, cosine theta. And row sine phi, R. So that becomes 4r cosine theta. And now, remember how we said theta is the exact same theta as polar coordinates? r is also the exact same r as polar coordinates. And r cosine theta, x. So this is 4x. Good. Now what about rho squared? Well, rho squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So, we get to x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4x. Nice. In some sense, we've now done the hard part. We've gone from our, our spherical coordinates and we've gone to Cartesian coordinates. We aren't done yet. We've got to rewrite it now in this form. So, the problem is that this x is not there with that x. We need to put them together into one square. One square to rule them all. And uh, another way you could say is like, well, right now, it's not a squared. It's x squared minus 4x. So you say, well, that's not good. We need to somehow complete the square. And how would we do that? Well, I moved the 4x across. Okay, so I'm I'm grouping variables together, and now we ask, what do we need to add so that this is a square, like that is? Well, to find it, you take the middle term, divide by 2, square it. So negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2, square it, positive 4. So it becomes plus 4. Well, I can't just add 4 there. I have to balance it. So if I add 4 there, I should add it to the other side. So that way, in that effect, nothing has changed. So whenever you modify an equation, you always have to make sure, hey, is it still the same equation? And if the answer is no, you got to do something. And uh, all right, well, we're almost there. So this part, we're good with. That's now a perfect square, x minus 2 squared, y squared, I'll go ahead and write that as says y minus 0 squared. There's no other y, but I, I really do want to write it in that format. z squared, I'll write as z minus 0 squared. 4, I want to write that as, as something squared, so that's our 2 squared. All right, good. Now, the last thing, because we do want to make sure we get all the points, center and radius. Well, as we said, the center, that's not too bad, 2, 0, 0. The radius, well, that's 2. And there we go, there we go. On a side note here, I know that you would never make such silly mistakes, but I know I've made such silly mistakes in the past. Make sure <laughs> you can read your 2 versus your z. Because sometimes people confuse the two. That's why you'll notice I'm, I try to consistently put a little line through, so I say, oh, that's a Z. 
because if you don't, sometimes in the heat of the moment, when you're running through the test, you're like, ah, oh, what? I need a four. What? That's a two squared. There's my four. Woo! No, 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 no. Be careful. Get the right answers. Okay. All right. Part B. We're only halfway through. Well, we did spend a lot of time talking about spherical, so so don't don't panic if it feels like we're going slow. All right. So part B. The cylindrical equations r equals 3 over 1 plus cosine theta z equals 0 represents a parabola in the xy plane. Okay, so remember, z equals 0 means we are in the xy plane. Now here's the thing. It says we're cylindrical coordinates. And how do cylindrical coordinates work? Well, you have your xy plane, and in the xy plane, it's polar. That's how you do it. That's r and theta. And then you say, well, how far off the xy plane do you go? That's z. So what we have is that spherical, sorry, not spherical, cylindrical, is really polar plus z. Now, why do I mention this? Well, we just said z equals 0. So this problem is really secretly a polar equation problem. And so it's a polar equation problem in disguise. All right, but that's okay. We, we know how polar works. We're probably a little bit more familiar with polar. So we have some various facts. We'll write down x is r cosine theta. We actually used that up, up in the previous problem. y is r sine theta. Uh, r squared is x squared plus y squared. And, and those are our, our basics. So we're going to rely on those as we go forward. OK, so <clears throat> we're putting all our energy into that equation. How do we put our energy into this equation? Well. Let's start. We have r equals 3 over 1 plus cosine theta. Now, I don't know about you, but in the past, fractions are usually a place where I make mistakes. So I like to try to get rid of fractions if I can. And we can. So what we can do is we can cross multiply. So this would say r times 1 plus cosine theta is equal to 3. Okay, great. Well, hmm, what does that give us? Well, if you multiply, that gives us r plus r cosine theta equals 3. Okay, good. Progress. Now, we prefer r squared. So you might say, well, let's multiply by r squared. There's pros and cons. Uh, sorry, not multiply by r squared, but multiply by r to get r squared. Uh, if we multiply through by r, well, then we get r squared cosine. Then we have a, a cosine. Uh, and there we have an r. Uh, not ideal. So uh, we can just, for now, uh, accept that it's r and work with it. And uh, we can go ahead and, and switch to x and y. So let's see what happens. If, if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. You know, that's the idea. Try something. So what is r? Square root of x squared plus y squared. What's r cosine theta? It's x. And what's 3? It's 3. Isn't that cool how 3 stays 3? Yeah, it's amazing. True story, true story. All right, cool, 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 cool. Except this doesn't look like that. We want to get rid of the square root. Now, we don't want to square right now uh, because this plus x is sort of bothersome. But we have the technology. The technology, also known as subtract x. Move it to the other side. Pretty good technology, right? Indeed. Only the best for our classes. That's right. So, updating. I have square root x squared plus y squared equals 3 minus x. Now we can square both sides. So square both sides, you'll get x squared plus y squared equals 3 minus x squared, which is 9 minus 6x plus x squared. All right. Good. Good. Progress. Progress. Actually, good progress. 
what do you see? Well, you'll see that we have x squared and we have x squared, which means cancellation. And so we get the following. We get that y squared equals 9 minus 6x. And now we're pretty much in that home stretch because we have an x, a y squared, and a number. We just have to move things around. So solve for x. So that says 6x equals 9 minus y squared. Divide by 6. x equals 9, 6 minus 1, 6 y squared. Now 9 over 6, also known as 3 over 2. And we say, lo and behold, we say, aha, here is our, our b is our constant, and our a is our coefficient of y squared. So just to make sure our grader knows, we're going to put it in a box. So a is minus 1 over 6, and b is 3 over 2. And life is good. And there we go. There we go. Lovely, lovely polar problem. All right. Well, good start. Let's keep going. Number two. We're asked to choose the correct equation from A through G on the right for each surface on the left and write it in the box provided. So probably these boxes right here. Now let's pause and see that there's one, two, three, four, five surfaces. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven equations. Meaning, we're not going to use all the equations. Okay, so uh, it's just not a matter of matching. We have to make sure we rule things out. So let's quickly talk about what surfaces we see. So this is hyperboloid of one sheet, also known as the hourglass. This is a cylinder. This is a... Uh, elliptic paraboloid, also known as bowl. This is a cone. This is an M&M. &M. Oh, wait, no, no, it's an ellipsoid, <laughs> but it looks like an M&M. &M. All right, so how do we figure it out? Well, let's do an easy one first. The cylinder is pretty easy. Now, why are cylinders easy? Well, cylinders, they're basically saying there's a variable not being used. So that as you go in a direction, in this case, as we move along y, we're always seeing the same shape as we slice. So we're looking for an equation which doesn't have a y. Essentially, we're looking for a missing variable. See, there's x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z, only x and z, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. So the cylinder, free b. D. Nice. Okay, now how do we do the others? Well, one thing is you can say, what do the equations look like, which can be useful. Another thing to do is say, let's take cross sections. So a big thing you can do is to say, let's slice. Now, when I say cross sections, what we're talking about is look for something simple. X equals zero, Y equals zero, z equals zero. And ask yourself, what happens when I set those equal to zero? What are the curves? So for instance, let's go with this first one. When you set x equals zero, you're in the y, z plane. What's the shape when you slice? When you slice x equals zero, you're getting sort of a belt. It's that middle part of that hourglass shape. So it should be an ellipse. So if you set x equals 0, do you see an ellipse? Well, uh, yes. And set x equals 0, no, that's a hyperboloid. X, no, that's parabola. Uh, we can skip that one. x equals 0, yeah, that's an ellipse. Uh, x equals 0, no, that's a parabola. And uh, no, that, those are lines. So you see, you can eliminate things. But you can't have eliminate all of them. So now that we, we know, when you set x equals 0, uh, well, we should have taking better notes. Let me let me take some better notes here. x equals 0, you get ellipse. And here x equals 0, 
hyperbola. And uh, here, x equals 0, you get a parabola. Here, x equals 0, you get an ellipse. Here, x equals 0, you get a parabola. And here, x equals 0, you get lines that look like that. So you, if you set x equals 0, z squared equals 2y squared, then that says, oh, uh, z equals plus or minus y. Okay, that's not saying, ah, you don't know. That's, that's two lines crossing. Okay, so we can already see it's one of these two equations. Cool. Well, let's uh, try something else. Okay, so now let's take another cross-section. Let's set y equals 0. Now, when we set y equals 0, you're going to see what this shape here. So that's a hyperbola. Okay, so y equals 0, what do you see? So y equals 0, you see an ellipse. All right, so this is not a. That's good to know. Uh, here, if you set y equals 0, uh, what do you get? Well, you get minus z squared is 1 plus x squared. What does that? Uh, nothing. There's nothing. So this totally misses when you set y equals 0. That's weird. Okay, how about here? y equals 0, you get a parabola. Right? Because if you set y equals 0, z equals 4x squared. Uh, how about here? y equals 0. If you set y equals 0, well, then you'd move the x right across. You'd have z squared minus x squared. And what would you have? You'd have hyperbola. So an ellipse is con plus x squared plus y squared equals number. A hyperbola is plus x squared minus y squared equals number. So that's the difference between ellipse and hyperbola. Now here, if we set y equals 0, we get an ellipse. Sorry, not an ellipse. We get a parabola. Whoops. Ah. Z equals 4x squared. And here, if we set y equals 0, again, we get lines. Okay, so we want to have ellipse and hyperbola. That's ellipse, ellipse, hyperbola, nothing, parabola, parabola, ellipse, hyperbola. Oh, that's the only thing. So it's got to be E. Okay. Cool. Well, now, actually, with all this work, the rest are going to come pretty quick, right? Because we've done a lot of the cross-section work. And now, let's see what's going on. What's going on? Now, here, if we set x equals 0, we see a parabola. If we set y equals 0, we see another parabola. So we want parabolas. Now, you might say, okay, is there anything that works? A parabola, parabola. Oh, wait, that's also a parabola, parabola. Which parabola, parabola do we want? Well, let's be a little bit more careful. If we rewrite here, that's equals 4x squared plus 3y squared. So what's happening is it's an up parabola. So it's up and up. Good. Here, it's c equals 4x squared minus 3y squared. So for x, it's up. For y, it's down. So this is not a bowl. This is a Pringle chip, or a saddle, is probably a better way to say it. So we say, ah, oh, we want the bowl. Okay, so, C. All right, now, cone. What happens when you slice a cone through the origin? What do you get? You get lines. You get crossing lines. Have we seen anything with crossing lines? Yeah, we've only seen one thing with crossing lines. So that means we should have this is a G. All right, the last one, our ellipsoid, our M and M. So we want ellipse, ellipse. Okay, we see an ellipse, ellipse. Double check to make sure nothing else has that. All right, that's the only ellipse, ellipse we have, which means that the last one for us to mark is going to be whoosh, A. So there we go. E, D, C, G, A. What didn't we use? We didn't use F. Why did we not use F? 
Well, F is a, uh, as we said, it's a saddle. A, a, it's a hyperbolic paraboloid is the technical term. What about B? Do you recognize what B is? Well, B, you saw how we intersected when we said y equals zero? We had, this is nothing. Well, what that means is this is actually a hyperboloid of two sheets versus a hyperboloid of one sheet. And so those were the two surfaces that weren't showing up, and they were the ones that we did not use. All right, good. Well, let's keep going. Number three. We're asked to find a set of parametric equations for the line formed by the intersection of the planes x plus 2y equals 1 minus x plus 5y plus 3z equals 11. Okay, now we're looking for a line. When we're looking for a line, we need two things. Point, direction. Okay, so let's start with one of them. And... Uh, Let's start with direction. And so pictorially, the idea is we have these two planes. So here's plane number one. And then we have a second plane that, uh, whoops, ah, I can draw a second plane here. Here's our second plane, plane number two. And what's happening is that they're intersecting. So we have this line, common line. We're asking the question, okay, what's going on with that line? Well, that line is in both planes, and that's an important thing. Now, we know that if you are a plane and you have a line in that plane, that line must be perpendicular to the normal. So, idea. Our direction of our line, what do we know? It must be perpendicular to the normals. Well, what's the normals? Read off the coefficients. So here, coefficient of x is 1, coefficient of y is 2. There is no coefficient of z, so it's 0. And it must be perpendicular. Again, we go through it. Minus 1, 5, 3. Okay, good. So we now know that our direction is perpendicular to two other directions. How do we find something perpendicular to two other things? There's actually a great tool for that, and that is the cross product. So this is a, a cross product problem. So we say, okay, so we're going to take the cross product. So 1, 2, 0, cross, negative 1, 5, 3. And uh, all right, so I. I do this with matrices, i, j, k, 1, 2, 0, minus 1, 5, 3. Okay, so remember, determinants, you're going on diagonals. So you have three diagonals going down, i, 2, 3, okay, that's 6i, j, 0, minus 1, well, hard to recover from a 0, k, 1, 5, 5k. Now, other direction, uphill. Minus 1, 2k, minus 2k. But because we're going uphill, we're subtracting minus 2k. 5, 0, i, 0, i. But because we're going uphill, yes, that's right. We're subtracting 0, i, not adding 0, i. Because, you know, we want to make sure we get that right. No one would know if you added 0, i. We wouldn't, we wouldn't report you. 3, 1, j. So 3 times 1 times. See, notice what I mean by 3, 1, j is I'm going up. I say, ah, I hit the wall, and I wrap around, and I keep going up. So that's what I mean by 3, 1, j. 3, j, but again, minus 3, j. Put this all together, we get 6 minus 0, 0 minus 3, 5 minus minus 2, 7. Now, can you check? Yes, there's a way to check without redoing the work, and that's actually good, because if you recheck it by doing the same work, you may make the same mistake. Quickly check if they're perpendicular. Dot products. 6 minus 6, 0. Adds up to 0. Nice! Minus 6. Minus 15. We're up to minus 21. Plus 21. 0. What? 
we definitely have our direction. No doubt, no doubt. So we've got our direction. Now, what about our point? Normally, the point is one of the easier things to find. It turns out the intersection of planes can be a little bit tricky. Of course, there's infinitely many points. What do we need to happen? Well, we need to find a point that somehow is on both planes at the same time. So, we say, all right, we have x plus 2y equals 1, minus x plus 5y plus 3z equals 11. Now, what do we see here? We see two equations, three unknowns. So I say, well, wait, how can we solve? Well, we can't. We can't get down to a single point. That's true. And we won't get down to a single point because there's, there's infinitely many of them. Look how many there are. There's, there's tons of points. So, but what can we do? Well, now we say, hey, hold on. We can make a choice. And as soon as we make a choice, then we just say, what's the consequence? All right, what could be a choice? Well, there's lots of choices you can make. And uh, so, for instance, you could say, well, uh, I could set x equals 0. Yeah, that gives us y equals a half. It works, but uh, it's not fun. Now, how about x equals 1? Well, uh, maybe. Let's try it. So suppose we set x equal 1. Then, because we do get a choice, then we say, well, we would need 2y to equal 1. And then here, since that's 1, we'd move that across. Uh, sorry, not 2y equals 1. 2y equals 0, right? Because 1, 1, uh, 1 subtract 1 is 0. Here, that's a minus 1. We get 5y plus 3z equals 12. Well, 2y equals 0. Hey, that tells us that y equals 0. Great, now I know that y equals 0, 3z equals 12, z equals 4. And so we get that 1, 0, 4. This is a common point. So it's a point on our line. Okay, so we found the direction, we found the point. The last thing is to write the equations. Now, parametric form. Parametric says you have x equals y equals z equals and you have these slots. Now, what goes into these slots? The first slot is your point. The second slot is your direction. And so, for us, we'd have x equals 1 plus 6t, y equals 0, minus 3t, so we'll just write that as minus 3t, and z equals 4, plus 7t. Right? So again, what's going on here is we plugged in 1, 0, 4, that's our point, 6, minus 3, 7, and that's our vector. And then we just rewrote it. All right, good, good. What a fun problem, what a fun problem. All right, let's keep going. Number four, a rocket is moving through space with acceleration. And so it's an acceleration function to minus cosine t zero. Now at time t equals zero, the rocket is at an initial point zero, zero, one and has an initial velocity of 204. Find the position of the rocket at time 1. So what's going on here? Well, it's a motion question. We're given acceleration and some information about how things are moving. So in other words, we have an initial location and an initial you know, velocity. And we want to put it all together and say, what is our position function? And then once we have our position function, Plug in one, life is good, Bob's your uncle, and we're done. Okay, so we'll write this out in a slightly different notation here. So I'm going to use a of t. I'm probably not going to draw my little vectors, but, but we're amongst friends. We know what that means. So if you ever see a, a little vector on top, that just means it's a, a function, which is a vector, a vector-valued function, if you will. 
Okay, so each entry is its own function. All right, and we're told that v of zero, our initial velocity, is two zero four, and s of zero, our initial position, zero zero one. All right, so now we're going to climb our ladder. We think of acceleration as the second derivative. And the reason we do that is because acceleration is the second derivative. Isn't that great how that works? So we say, all right, we want to just get to the function. So we're going to take antiderivatives. So the acceleration, when we integrate, what do we get? Velocity. So we're integrating. So, all right, so we integrate. And we have that velocity is term by term. Integral of 2, 2t two plus a constant. Integral of negative cosine. All right, now we have to pay attention to our, our signs. Is the integral of negative cosine negative sign or is it positive sign? It's one of those things that's like, oh, you have to think about for a second. And it is negative sign because the derivative of sine is positive cosine. Okay, but again, a constant. I'm using a different constant because the, the constants are, are different. Different slots, different constants. And then the integral of zero, well, that's zero plus a constant. Okay, now let's use our initial conditions. V of zero, well, that would be two times zero plus a minus zero plus b and and then c and we're told that that's whoops two zero four so we say aha you know a b c okay so let's update so we now have that v of t is two t plus two negative sine t and so in other words, using ABC, plug in for ABC. All right, halfway up our ladder. Let's take our next step. So our next step is now we're going to integrate velocity. Integrate velocity, you get position. So again, you integrate. And what do we get? And we get S of t is integral of 2t plus 2, t squared plus 2t. 2t or not 2t? That is the question. And another constant. Ah, working our way through the alphabet, we're up to the letter d. Integral of negative sine is positive cosine. Cosine t plus a constant, e. And then integral of 4 is 4t plus a constant, f. We plug in initial conditions. S of 0. Well, 0 plus 0 plus d. Cosine of 0 is 1. So 1 plus e. And then 0 plus f. And that should be 0, 0, 1. OK, so we set things equal. And what do we get? Well, we see d equals 0. e is minus 1, right? Because 1 plus e equals 0. So e is minus 1. And f is positive 1. So we now have that s of t looks like t squared plus 2t plus 0. Then we have cosine t plus e, which is minus 1. And then we have 4t plus f, which becomes 4t plus 1. So, there we go. This is our position function for any time t. Now, remember, what are we after? Position at time 1. So, how do we find it? We plug in 1. So, final step. We're really there. Home stretch. S of 1. 1 plus 2, 3.
cosine of 1, also known as cosine of 1. That is correct. Yeah, it's just a weird number. And subtract 1. And then we get 4 plus 1 is 5. So 3, cosine of 1 minus 1, 5. And we're done. Nice. Woohoo. <laughs> All right. Good. We're picking up a little bit of speed after the first couple of problems. We should finish with time. I hope we do. So let's keep going. Number five. We're given three points, P, Q, and R. And we're asked to compute the projection of P, Q onto P, R. Okay, projection. So what's the idea here? So Let's say if this is P, here is Q, here is R. I don't know if that's the right arrangement, but there are three points. And so we have our vector P to Q and our vector P to R. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the projection, which is of PQ onto P to R, which says, imagine if you drop straight down and you were to find this vector. So it's how much of PQ is there that's parallel to PR. I, I often say it's how much of PQ is there in the direction of PR. So how does one find this? Well, uh, what do we do? We know the right direction, and because every vector is direction and length. So we say, look, direction, easy. That would be the same as the vector PR over the magnitude of PR. Because whenever I want a, a vector, sorry, when I want a direction, I choose a unit vector. Unit vectors for direction. Okay, what about our length? What's that? Well, that, imagine for a second I call this theta. And then I said, well, this length I can find and now, uh, since this is the adjacent side, the length, well, that would be our length of the hypotenuse cosine theta. Okay, so that's our vector. So, what do we get? Well, so we have, it's the magnitude of PQ cosine theta over the magnitude of PR times PR. Okay, so that's that's the answer. But this seems annoying because how do you find cosine theta? This is when we have the great I remember there's something with cosine. What is it? Well, the thing with cosine is it's related to dot product. And in particular, if you multiply both top and bottom by the magnitude of PR what you get is at the top, it's a dot product. It's PQ dot PR. The bottom is actually a dot product as well. It's PR dot PR and then times PR. So we need to compute these dot products. There's two of them. Multiply by the original vector PR. So let's Go ahead and work that out. Okay, so here we go. We have, first off, we'll find our vectors P, Q, and P, R. So P, Q is, we start at P, we end at Q, we take the differences. 2 to 7, up by 5. 1 to 3, up by 2. 2 to 7, up by 5. P, R. Okay, 2 to 4, up by 2. 1 to 0, down by 1, minus 1. 2 to 4, up by 2. So 5, 2, 5, 2 minus 1, 2. So PQ dot PR, we have 5, 2, 5, dot 2 minus 1, 2. So that would be... 10, 5 times 2, minus 2, 2 times minus 1, 
plus 10. 5 times 2. 10 plus 10 is 20. Subtract 2 gives 18. We also have PR dot PR. That's our 2 minus 1, 2 dot 2 minus 1, 2. And uh, that would be 4, 2 times 2, plus 1, which is minus 1 times minus 1, plus 2 times 2, which is 4, which is 9. Now, 18 over 9 is 2. So our answer is going to become, well, we'll go ahead and write out 18 over 9 times PR, 2 minus 1, 2. So that's the same as 2 times 2 minus 1, 2, which is, hmm, because I like to multiply that 2 through. It just, I will put it here. It is 4 minus 2, 4. All right, good. So that's the projection. Projection goes back to dot product, part A. What's part B? All right, let's take a look. Part B, find the area of the triangle formed by the above three points. Now, what's area? Well, if we come back to this triangle, we could say, you know, how could we find area? Well, if you actually look at the picture here, you could say, well, I know this side. That's cool. That's PR. I'll just take that length. That's our base. What's the height? Well, see how we ca came down here and said, well, that's cosine? So we can do the same thing. It would be magnitude of PQ sine theta. So this is base, height, and what's the area of a triangle? One half base height. Okay, so our area is one half this expression. Now, how does one find sine? Well, dot product is cosine, so it's not that one, so it's probably the other one. And it is, it's cross product. So it turns out that this is one half the magnitude of PQ cross PR. Now, when you take a cross product, if you switch the order, you'll flip the sign, but because we're taking the magnitude, it doesn't matter. So I did PQ cross PR first, just because Q came before R. We already have PQ and PR, so we don't have to find them again. So we just need to carry out our cross product. So let's start. We'll switch colors because we're doing a slightly different thing. And uh, because I also like to use different colors. So we're finding our cross product, PQ cross PR. So that's our I, J, K. I write down the entries of PQ. 5, 2, 5. I write down the entries of PR. 2 minus 1, 2. Okay, here we go. I times 2 times 2. We're doing our diagonals. 4i. J times 5 times 2, right? We wrap around. If you hit the wall, come around. So that would be 10j. K times, wrap around, 5 times minus 1, minus 5k. Other direction. 2 times 2 times k is 4k, but subtract it, minus 4k. Minus 1 times 5, up around, times i, minus 5i, but we're subtracting it. So when you subtract it, it'll end up being a plus. And 2 times 5 times j, that's 10j. But what's happening here? We're going to subtract that. So we're going to subtract 10j. And lo and behold, what do we get? 4 uh, plus 5 makes 9. 10 minus 10 makes 0. And then we have minus 9. All right, cool. Now we can quickly check if that's correct. We just say, okay, dot product. 45 and 0 and minus 45, good. And we have 18 and 0 and minus 18, which is 0, which is good. Now, I'm actually going to write this in a slightly different way. I'm going to say this is the same as 9, 1, 0, minus 1. 
So in other words, I'm going to pull the 9 out. And I can do that. I can pull scalars in and out. So we're almost there. So what do we have? Well, we have that this is 1 half times the magnitude of the vector 9, 1, 0, minus 1. Now, that 9 we can pull out in front. So that's 9 over 2, magnitude of 1, 0, minus 1. And I uh, almost made it. Okay, down here. So that's 9 over 2. And now how do you find that? Square root of, square root each entry, 1 plus 0 plus 1. So we end up with 9 halves square root of 2. And we're done. Wow, that's cool. And uh, all right, beautiful answer. And we're ready to keep going. Number six, back to particles. So we have that the position of a particle in three-dimensional space is given by the vector function, r of t, 3t squared, 3t squared, t cubed. OK, so we have our position function. Part A. Find the velocity vector of the particle at time t. What's the relationship between position and velocity? Well, the answer is if you start with position, take the derivative, you get velocity. So our velocity function, we'll write v of t, that's our r prime of t, and we take derivatives term by term, 6t, 6t, 3t squared. OK, well, that was not bad. Cool. Part B. Find the speed of the particle at time t. Now, we found velocity. What's speed? Aren't they the same? Well, it turns out there's a slight difference. Speed is a, a measurement, and so it's a non-negative number. Velocity says, oh, I'm not just a measurement of how fast you're going, but I'm also going to tell you what direction you're in. So velocity is speed plus direction, where speed is its magnitude. So if I want speed, I say, oh, take velocity and find the magnitude. So we say, well, we're in luck. I have velocity. So speed, it's the magnitude of velocity. So that's the magnitude of 6t, 6t, 3t squared. OK, so we have to compute this. Well, all right, that's the square root of, we'll have 6t quantity squared plus 6t quantity squared uh, plus 3t squared quantity squared. All right, well, that's uh, the square root of 36t squared plus 36t squared plus 9t to the fourth. Now, technically, that's a correct answer. We're going to improve on it by cleaning it up because I see a part C coming. And it's asking something about distance, which I think is going to tie back to part B. So when I see that I'm going to use it, I want it to be as simple and clean as possible. Now, looking at what we have, everything inside the square root is divisible by a 9, because 36 is divisible by 9, and so is 9, and t squared. So let's rewrite this as 9t squared. Then we have 4 and 4 and t squared. Well, the square root of 9t squared, that's going to be what? Well, that's going to be 3t. They might say, whoa, hold on, Steve. I've heard you say this before. Square root of t squared, absolute value. Well, yeah, true. The good news is t is greater than or equal to 0. OK, so we don't need absolute value here. And then we have the square root of 8 plus t squared. So there we go. There is our speed. Ready for part C. Find the distance traveled by the particle between time t equals 1 to time t equals square root of 8. 
Now we have to be careful here because there's a couple of ideas which are really similar but are different in terms of what it's actually looking for. It's asking for distance traveled. So that's different from saying, oh, I know where I am at time one, I can plug in a number. I know where I am at time root eight, I can plug in a number. Just find the distance between those. That's not the distance traveled. That would be the straight line distance. And the fancy word is displacement if we also add in the direction. So we're not looking for the straight line distance from start to stop. We want to, you know, go along the route. Well, how do we find distance traveled? Well, it turns out that an easy way to find your distance you travel is you say, well, I can think of my speed. That's how fast I'm moving at any given time. And I'll time that by a small change in t. So my speed varies, but that's okay. I say, look, I'll, I'll break my time into small pieces. And for each small piece, I'll say speed times that small bit of time. That's the distance I travel in a small period. But I want the total, so I add it up. So the integration of speed is distance. Well, now that we have that, we say, great. We know when we start and stop, that gives us our A and our B. We also know our speed because that's from our previous problem. So we can set this up. 1 to square root of 8. And then we're going to have our 3t square root 8 plus t squared dt. And we're off to the races, not from the problem. OK, so we have this integral. That looks a little bit and they're like, oh no, is this trig sub? No, no, <laughs> don't panic yet. When you see something that you can't integrate right away, you start going through what are things you can do? You're like, is there a simple algebra thing? Is there a simple trig thing? But here there's no trig function, so we're not doing that. And then you start saying, well, is there a simple substitution? Now, when I'm looking for substitutions, I always remind myself that substitution is an inside job. And I say, well, I see an 8 plus t squared on the inside. That's a pretty good candidate. The derivative of t squared involves t dt. That's a great candidate. So we're going to make that substitution. u equals 8 plus t squared. Then du would be 2t dt, or if you like, 1 half du is t dt. So in other words, because I see a t dt, then I want to get t dt by itself. And constants are pretty friendly. We're very flexible with moving constants around. So update. Since we're doing a substitution, we're going to update all of our things. Remember that these bounds, these are really t bounds. And so we're going to u bounds. So plug in. If t equals 1, 8 plus 1 says we start at 9. 8 plus square root of 8 squared, well, that's 8 plus 8, which is 16. The 3 is 3. Yes, not much we're going to do with that. The t dt will be a 1 half du. The square root of 8 plus t squared, well, that becomes square root of u which in a calculus-friendly way is u to the 1 half. OK, so what do we have? Well, this is uh, integral 9 to 16. I don't know why I'm writing this again. We don't need to do that. Well, uh, reflexes, I guess. OK, so when we integrate, we're going to get 3 halves. u, you add 1 to the exponent, so that's 3 halves. 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. And now you multiply by the reciprocal. So flip three halves, you get two thirds. Evaluate, uh, whoops, nine to 16. Twos and threes cancel. Oh, great. We're really close, really close. Okay, now what's the last thing for us to do? Well, uh, we just have to plug in. So we have equals, 16 to the 3 halves 
minus 9 to the 3 halves. And now you're probably thinking, great, 16 cubed is a number, uh, what is that? Oh, 4,096. Say, oh, sure, I'll buy that. What's the square root of 4,096? 64, right? We all know that. Wait, do we? No, no. Remember, we're, we're, we're make it easy on yourself. So you have 16 to 3. So you can think of that as really you're cubing and taking a square root. Now, which one do you do first? You should always do the thing that makes things smaller first. So think of this as 16 to the 1 half cubed. Similar, yeah, you could say that 9 cubed is 729. But it's easier to think of, well, start with 9 to the 1 half and cube that. So 16 to the 1 half, that's 4. So we have 4 cubed. 9 to the 1 half is 3. So 3 cubed. 4 cubed, 64. 3 cubed, 27. What's 64 subtract 27? Well, it's 37. And there we go. There's our answer. <sighs> cool. One more to go. Let's take a look at that last problem. Our final problem, number seven. Find the distance from the point 1 minus 8, 0 to the plane that is perpendicular to the curve. R of t is t cosine t sine t, t plus 2 at time t equals 0. Okay, we've got a lot going on here. First off, we, we have a curve that's doing something. So there's this curve out in space, and it's moving. Now, at a particular time, there's going to, we're pausing for a second. It says, look, at time t equals 0, there's this plane here. And this plane is perpendicular to the curve. And we're going to figure out what that plane is. And then in addition to that, we have one more piece of information, which is that there's a point out here, 1, 1, negative 8, 0. And we're trying to say, how far is this point to the plane? So our final answer is a number. So we're after a distance. How do we get to that number? Well, let's start unraveling. First off, let's get this plane. Now, we're told it's perpendicular to this curve at a particular time. Now, when you're after a plane, two things. So for a plane, we need to have our point and a normal. All right, so how do we find the point? Well, we know it's perpendicular at time t equals 0. So the point that we can use is the point on the curve at time t equals 0. So the point will be r of 0. Now we plug in 0. What do we get? Well, we get 0, because we have 0 times cosine 0, sine of 0, which is 0, and 0 plus 2, which is 2. Now, normal. How do we find that? Well. What it means is that, is that if you were to use a microscope and zoom in on this piece right here, well, that the, the curve would look like a straight line. And that straight line would be passing perpendicular to the plane. So we say, oh, so that line, how that line moves, that line direction, that's the normal. So how do you find the direction of a tangent line? The derivative. So the normal is r prime of 0. OK, now this, uh, we'll have to do some work on the side. What is r prime? Well, that's OK. We'll do that work over here. So r prime of t, well, term by term. So product rule, derivative of the first, the derivative of t is 1 times the second, which is cosine t. And then plus t times the root of cosine. Now the root of cosine is negative sine, so minus t sine t. So that's the root of the first entry. The root of sine, positive cosine. And the root of t plus 2 is 1. 
Okay, so when we plug zero in, what do we get? Well, we get cosine of zero minus zero times zero, so that's a one. And then we get a, another one, cosine of zero is one, and then we get another one, 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 one. Okay, cool, one, one, one. All right, so that's our normal. Now that we have our point in our normal, we can write down our plane. So, here we go, our plane. It looks like the following. So the normal gives us our coefficients, one times x, one times y, one times z equals, plug in, zero, zero, two. Zero plus zero plus two, two. Okay, now, we're probably feeling pretty good about ourselves. Like, we found the plane, woohoo! But we're not done, right? Because we're not after the plane, we're after a distance. Now we say, okay, so how do we find a distance from a point to the plane? Now there's a couple of ways to do it, and I tend to think very geometrically. You can use things like projection, but I like to think in terms of, of lines. And I say, well, I now can say, I can find the line that goes through 1 minus 8, 0 and would intersect perpendicular. Just like how this curve intersected perpendicular. How do I do that? Well, I can use the normal vector as the direction of the line. So I'm going to make a line, and we'll do it in parametric form, x equals y equals z equals, and uh, it has the point 1, minus 8, 0, and it has the direction of 1, 1, 1. So x equals 1 plus t, y equals minus 8 plus t, and z equals t. That passes through the point, and it's perpendicular to the point. So what I can do is I can plug in, and I say, well, what are x, y, and z? So that this is true. All right, well, let's uh, get to work on figuring that out. So what do we have? Well, we have uh, 1 plus t plus negative 8 plus t plus t equals 2. Okay, so that would be 3 t's. And now we can move things across. Add 8, that would be 10. Subtract 1, that would be 9. So that would be 3t equals 9. So that says t equals 3. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it says if I want to find that point, which is on that line segment, I plug in t equals 3. So we say, aha. So let's update our picture. We had 1, negative 8, 0. We have this plane out here, and now we found that this point here corresponds to when you plug in t equals 3. So what, what do we get? Well, we end up with a 1 plus 3, which is 4, negative 8 plus 3, negative 5, and then 0 plus 3, 3. All right. So we found the point on the plane closest to the line. All right, woohoo! Are we done? No, because it's not a length. We need a length. Okay, that's all right. We're still closer. So what's the last thing to do? Well, the last thing to do is to say, all right, what's this length? So our length uh, is the distance between these two points. So length is the square root of, and we'll just say from there to there, 4 minus 1 squared plus minus 5 minus minus 8 squared plus 3 minus 0 squared. So it's literally just distance between two points. All right, well, that's the square root of 3 squared minus 5 plus 8 is positive 3, so plus 3 squared plus 3 squared. 
So, oh, that's really the square root of 9 plus 9 plus 9, that's 27. Or you could say that's the square root of 9 times 3, which is 3 square root 3. Now we're done. 3 root 3. And that is a length. It's a number. All right. Okay, so this one, see, there's a process here. Now, there are other ways to do this. Uh, you can find the formula that finds the distance between a point and a plane. You can go from an arbitrary point on the plane, and then you can do some projection. That works, and if that works for you, wonderful. And if it doesn't, don't do it. There's lots of ways to get to this answer. The good news is you only need one. And so find what works for you. Okay, this is going to be an interesting test. A lot of people are like, oh, I know geometry. I practically live in it. And yeah, we do live in three dimensions. It doesn't always mean our intuition is right. So take your time. I know there's a lot here. And I know we used up a lot of time talking. But take your time. Think about things. Be methodical. You can do this. I believe in you. You're wonderful. All right. Good luck, and I hope to see you again. Bye.